Mr. Chairman, may I present Mr. Yusuf? Thank you for, for inviting me. At that time, there was a cemetery here. May I always like to tell my to Georgian politics when I was studying in library at Columbia University, his book about Georgian political landscape. And I thought I was choosing from his book which party to join at that time because I didn't have much of uh, my own first-hand knowledge because of distance. And of course, communication did work as well back in the 90s as they do now. Uh, I'm very honored that by introduction that Andre did, and indeed uh, he spoke very eloquently about Ukraine's and Georgia's synergy and chemistry we have with each other. Uh, and uh, by the way, one of the main features why I think Ukraine is a separate nation, which is from Russia, which many people were still had uh, doubts about, is that Ukrainians like Georgia so much. And that's a clear feature that they, they, that's a very uh, typical national characteristic. Well, Russians also like us, but from different angles. It's like uh, at least some of their leaders like us, like nice meal to be consumed that go uh, uh, good whenever they decide. And that's not the way to you approach, of course, your neighbors. Uh, now, I'm tremendously honored uh, by Caucasus uh, Net, uh, by uh, also by Philip Eckert for his uh, foundation's uh, generous support, but also not not only for me to be here, but also for what they are doing for our university. Because I think the main cause of transformation that's you are running away from something, and the best way to run, the best way to have speed is to get new educated generation. Uh, and of course, uh, great thanks to uh, Nicola and his team because he, will, he there without his daily support and real truly uh, free spirit, it wouldn't be possible for this program to thrive. Now we are really at interesting moment now in the world, and the, the fact that so many of you showed up at the time of World Cup and the University holidays really shows you that you, maybe you are also preoccupied by something. And I think the main reason for preoccupation of today is that basically it's very simple. It's like uh, three world, two words, uh, uh, three words, the world is falling apart. It is falling apart the way how we knew it. You know, I was, uh, as I said, I, I studied at Columbia University, and my professor at Columbia University was Oscar Schachter and uh, Lou Henke. Uh, and they, this where Oscar Schachter was the man who basically helped to draft the Charter of the United Nations. He was uh, uh, first legal counsel to the United Nations, and he was in, at a conference in San Francisco as the main legal negotiator on the U.S. side to draft the U.N. legal charter. And their main courses were the main questions they asked in their seminar and in the lectures to Lou Hankin, who was like the, maybe the father of the uh, international, international, at least U.S. international law, was whether might makes right or right makes might. And so, and these are two different visions of the world. And indeed, there are, even both schools acknowledge that basically right makes might. Because I also started, I didn't really study from subject with the army in Ukraine. I started with uh, this class at Kiev University. And the first lecture we received in international law from representative of Soviet school, Professor Lukashuk, who was usually the other counterpart from uh, Henke's side, when, because Henke was head of U.S. negotiating team, and Lukashuk usually was head of Soviet negotiating team, was that basically, yes, right, made might. Even Soviet Union acknowledged the system, despite all the uh, hypocrisies they were implemented, but they also acknowledged that uh, basically there is this international law, clear set of rules, and they apply and uh, they protect uh, equally small countries and big countries. And so now here we are in Switzerland, and uh, I had the interviews yesterday at several uh, t t at television switch Roman as well as radios. And usual questions that come: oh, Okay, you, you provoke the war, right? Okay, well, why would or the so Ukrainians, so Russians have also their interests, right? And I'm telling you, you know, I we aspire to the European Union. Yes, true. We'll sign. We'll be signing association agreement. Great event. I don't have such a big opinion about the Europeans to think that they, are, uh, they only would be preoccupied by problems of some Georgia and Ukraine. I think they do, wouldn't care less if they if would not concern that. I think the real issue here is, and the real issue what I'm trying to explain also to Swiss audiences is that we say, why would you care? Because it's all about you. It's not about people in Lugansk or Donetsk or South Ossetia and other murky places of which you never heard. It's about you. Because tomorrow, if this thing continues, 
There will be millions of refugees from Eastern Ukraine. And where will these refugees go? I, I know everybody in Kiev and nobody is ready to receive them. There is no money, there is no place. In Georgia at least we had tourist infrastructure in the 90s which received refugees, half a million refugees from Abkhazia. Now it's all privatized in Ukraine. They don't even have that. They don't have place to put them in, they don't have money to shelter them, they don't have money to employ them. So where will they come? They will come to the places they usually go to in Europe and the, Switzerland is one of the first destinations. Maybe some of you are from the Balkans in the 90s and you remember how it was after uh, that kind of wars in the Balkans. And they are going to come there. If there are new zones of uh, illegality and illegitimacy in uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, and these are not small areas like South Ossetia, which is two narrow mountainous valleys where only 10 or 15,000 people stay as a population. They are going to turn into major zones of huge zones with cities inhabited, big cities and uh, big areas of illegal trafficking, of all kinds of bad things. Where is going this traffic going to, to be directed to? Of course, to this place, because money is here. Traffic usually goes where the money is. So they should worry about that. They should worry about, and then finally, they should worry about the fact that if international law collapses, who is benef who benefited from international law and order? Developed world. Developed world and smaller big countries. Switzerland is a small country, but had enjoyed the longest period of stability ever enjoyed by any country in the world his, his history of humanity. And why did it enjoy it? Because it was abiding by rules. There were rules, there were certain regimes, legal regimes, and Switzerland fit into that and somehow was protected by that. Who else but Swiss would understood, understand what's at stake there? And who else can, but that even bigger European countries and the United States would understand what's at stake there because they benefited from the fact that, yes, small countries were protected, but these international regimes were very predictable. And long term development and, copper and uh, wealth comes, as Swiss very well know, from stable peace and stable rules and predictable rules which they had known beforehand. So, so, this is at stake now because what Russia said by Crimea is that international law is over. Whatever Lukashuk, Schachter, Henkin, or your great professors are teaching you, that's out of the window, over. They call it, they invent a new term already they, with regards to South Ossetia and Abkhazia, they call it new reality. Before it was international law, and now they call it new reality. A new reality is that whatever I decide, me, Vladimir Putin, should be the map, that's the new reality, and you better accept it. Lavrov, with very, like, a poker face, says, well, you know, of course, to everything, answer, you violate this agreement, Budapest memorandum, bilateral treaties, uh, you know, like OSC charter, new reality. You had a uh, ceasefire agreement in Georgia, Sarkozy signed in 2008, according to which R Russia had to withdraw their troops from Georgia. Two months later, Putin, even without him needing it, bought two Mistrals from France, two ships, battleships, so worth uh, more than 2 billion euros, for so that Sarkozy would not remember the treaty that he himself guaranteed. But that's not the only thing, that how they wouldn't remember, they said, okay, yes, Russians never denied they signed it. Yes, they signed it. Did we, you sign it? Yes, we did. Did you pledge to withdraw troops? Yes, we did. Why didn't you withdraw them? Well, there is new reality. Small countries like Georgia, or Latvia, or Lithuania, or uh, Moldova, would be very worried, or Kazakhstan would be worried by that, but Japan is very worried by that. Philippines is very worried by that. Everybody should be worried because everybody has, they are big, but they also have bigger neighbor, also with the army, also with the money, also with nuclear weapons. And one day that my neighbor might say, oh, by the way, I need this or that island. New reality. Uh, so that's where we are now with regards to what's really happening and why it's so worrisome. Now. The, uh, we, should be realize, we should be realizing that this thing has continuation. Because how is the world reacting now? You know, like, what happened in Georgia, in South Ossetia, when Russia came in on a false pretenses that we attacked them? Many Europeans swallowed the story. We were bought, you know, in 2008, how the war had started. I was having. I was trying to lose weight in an uh, Italian resort, uh, but I also took it uh, as an opportunity to take, take my family somewhere abroad together we went. So we were there in a very nice mountainous sanatorium, Alto Adige. And, I said, and the, this is a place where lots of Russian, uh, Russian business people and kind of, you know, this were 
famous journalists were, etc. So, so there was one. There were only three channels on my television. One was Italian. One was uh, CNN. One was Russian channel. So I okay. So CNN, nothing was happening. I started to watch Russian channel. Suddenly, Russian channel started to show that my country has war. I started to go home, and everybody was shrugging their shoulders, saying nothing is happening on the ground. What they want? Do they want? But you, I watched them, and they looked like we had basically full-blown war on the ground. Then, three days after they arrived there, all sides of Georgian government were brought down by cyber attack. Then my friend, President of Ukraine, Yushchenko, called me and warned that Russian Black Sea Fleet is heading toward Georgian shores. Ukraine had right to stop them. He issued a decree that, uh, to stop them, but of course they couldn't care less. So I had to leave the place and go back. And then suddenly, uh, then the, the very moment I arrived, that was the morning when large-scale explosions, attacks on the, on the places started and on the civilian population on the, on the other side, from the other side. And, but at, after seven days of those attacks, Georgia finally was compelled to respond after we heard uh, very credible reports that Russian tanks were moving through Rocky Tunnel, that's a place connecting Georgia to Russia. And then Russia suddenly sells, starts to sell story, everything prepared, pre prepared, like pre cooked war. 3,000 dead in Skin Valley. Now, one week before, this place of Skin Valley had a population of 3,000 people. Now, one week before, well, six days before, they start, Russia started to evacuate them, not because they cared about people. Simply, there is a small, narrow, mountainous road linking that place to Russia. If they had not evacuated the population of people should think had started, then these people would have jammed road for tanks. That was so obvious. So they evacuated almost all of them. But then I am on that night when the whole thing started on CNN, and I see a line under me. Skin Valley, 3,000 people dead. Interfax agents. And even me, who knew that it couldn't be even possibly true, I started to really worry. So because we were doing artillery shelling, uh, of very we, by, way, by the way, with very precise Israeli artillery, of the government building. And I thought maybe, I don't know, maybe something went wrong and there is a significant civilian death. Of course, none of that happened. happened. Then many, many investigative commissions was happened. Not a, they were talking about dead children, women, not a single case had been detected. Putin is fighting now. People either should be hit in the teeth and understand that it can no longer bite you, or it bites you, clinches the teeth, and then it will calm down. While it's trying to bite you and is hoping that it can bite you and eat you, there is no point to negotiate. Putin is right now in that mode of attack. There is no way to negotiate while he's on the attack. When he understands finally that his economy is suffering, or he no longer can take Ukraine in places, or, or things are really stagnated, then he will be willing to talk on. Just, and we saw in Georgia what it means to make peace deals from the position of weak. It's a disaster. Shevardnadze did it three times. He trusted the Russians three times in Abkhazia. First time, Russians, after deal, I was present at that deal making in, I was just a student, but happened to be present at, uh, in Moscow during international agreements, uh, guaranteed by Yeltsin. They shook hands. Yeltsin elevated separatist leader to this level of warring size. That's exactly like Russians are trying to do with Donetsk and Lugansk. We came back with hopes of peace. In one week time, with the help of Russians, they took basically half of Abkhazia and opened the border and then everything could come in. Then he signed another agreement, Shevardnadze, no, not learning from the first experience. We drew all Georgian heavy equipment and troops from everywhere. Russians also pro Russians loaded all Georgian equipment on their ships and brought it to other places, took it away. And Russians had to do the same with separatists. But of course, they would not do that. And within weeks, they occupied the rest of Abkhazia and we got half a million refugees in three days' time. And then to solidify the situation, because half of the because place was totally empty and separatists were not numbers in numbers, he brought another agreement. Yeltsin again told him, "I will bring back your refugees if you sign further agreement." He signed further agreement that they established their uh, military presence and they basically shut off Abkhazia from the rest of Georgia so that no refugee could ever step back from no displaced person. That's our experience when you do it just on depend uh, rely upon one side. So it's, of course, in the end, every war ends in some kind of peace deal. But right now, 
it's not looking good. Because this man, I had the pleasure of having numerous conversations with Putin. And he never changed his story from day one. Day one, he, I, had eight, I spent eight hours with him, one to one. He was very sweet. He showed me Stalin office, he, of which he was proud of, because he moved his um, office from big, bigger office to Secretary General of Brezhnev to smaller office to Stalin, making the point that basically that was what, were, what his priorities were. But already at the very first sweet meetings, he told me several things here that he never changed. He told me that uh, uh, every country that tries to defy him in post-Soviet zone would get attacked. Then at later meetings, he specified that Georgia might be a candidate. He also told me that Baltic countries are not defendable. That's his obsession. He also mentioned that Crimea is a Russian land. And he also mentioned that he, would, uh, he, will, he will one day destroy NATO. And if you look at this guy, one thing you can never refuse him is consistency. And uh, now we should also look what are the reasons. Is it just purely land grab? What are the reasons why he is perpetuating this kind of aggressive behavior all the time? I think it's much wider than the land grab. Look why Georgia became the first target of attack. When Putin became president, first thing he did, he reintroduced Soviet anthem, and he said that this, the solution of Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe, as you rightly said, of the 21st century, 20th century. When we, what Georgia did, what we did at my first inauguration, because it's culmination of the thing that will have been happening tomorrow in uh, Brussels, signing of association agreement, we raised European flag as official flag of Georgia together with our restored Christian flag, which also signifies Christian and European values of Georgia. We announced on the day one of our presidency we will aspire towards the European Union, far away and run away from the Soviet Union. Georgia not only did symbolic things, we backed it up with reforms. Gia Nodia spoke about some of them, but the main thing is that in terms of corruption, 98% of Georgia said in 2003 they encountered corruption firsthand. In the end of my presidency, it was between 0.2 and 2%, depending upon poll. Uh, there was uh, Georgia's economy tripled. We built new cities without oil and gas, really new modern infrastructure, and many other things. And Russia didn't do any of this, couldn't do any of this. So when, after two, in 2008, Vladimir Putin publicly in front of television cameras together with Sarkozy first and then in front of on the press conference pledged to uh, hang me by my balls and uh, I was asked about it what I think I had two different answers one that he wouldn't have enough rope for that and the other that he would only get to that can only realistically get to that part uh, but, uh, but in real terms, uh, and of course Medvedev, after this declaration of his boss, immediately said, Saakashvili is a dead man, like dead man. Well, of course, after stories of uh, Politkovsky, Litvinenko, and some others would sound very realistic, right? But four years later, when asked about success of Georgia reforms, Medvedev on two occasions had to say, First, he said, well, Georgia is, yeah, they're good reforms, but Georgia is, is significant. We are a big Russia. We cannot do it. Second time, he said, well, the really interesting reforms. I really hate Saakashvili, but we have to acknowledge we have to learn from them. And not because he's so, suddenly he's so, his mind opened up. No. Because the Russian public was asking why the hell if Georgian police, Georgia was one of the most criminalized, one of the most corrupt, one of the most hopeless places in the Soviet Union. Georgia was only very good for singing, dancing, and uh, uh, you know, making tables and drinking. Why the hell the savage Georgia suddenly are much more civilized than us, great Russia with great civilization? Why do when we go to Georgia? Because we unilaterally liberalize visa regimes. It's very hard for Georgians to get to Russia. And it, we made it, we any, I personally uh, initiate to annihilate visa requirements for Georgia, Russians to visit Georgia. When, when they come and they see uh, border guards smiling and they, you know, uh, very fast procedure and handing them even a bottle of wine when they come with big smile and uh, nice Russian. And then 
policeman's manager, we were simple bureaucracy, no heavy police presence in this city, that absolute total safety, five times less crime rate than Russia, lowest crime rate in Europe according to the European Union. That's not my words. Eight easiest place to do business in the world. Russia uh, was struggling to, uh, to be uh, somewhere around 100. Ukraine is 137th, um, um, unfortunately. And then they start to ask questions. If these savages could do it, that we only thought that are bearable on a table, how, why we don't, why our government is failing to deliver? But now imagine if, okay, Georgia is still a weird, small, still bizarre place for many Russians. But now, but of course, Russian myth identifies fully itself with Ukraine. They have this thing that they come from Kiev Rus. That's something that happily is repeated by many Westerners, that oh, Russia has right, they come from Kiev Rus, right? First of all, the whole thing is doubtful. I mean, the whole legend of this Kiev Rus, because it was another country, and Russia is another country, and history had strange twists. But OK, even if it had been case, OK, Russians, they now start to discover slowly but surely that Ukraine is still another nation, and whom they call as fascists and Banderovics. In fact, they, everybody who wants to be Ukrainian, they call them this. But, but they still identify themselves with Ukrainians. And what if this Ukraine with which they identify suddenly does real reforms? What if this Ukraine suddenly starts to tackle corruption? What if this Ukraine becomes efficient? What if this Ukraine suddenly starts to develop fast? Then Putin is in really, really big trouble. The Georgia questions will ask very unserious, they would sound very unserious in comparison to what might happen. And this is an old Russian thinking. I saw some Polish friends here in audience. And you know, Poland has greatest history of, uh, I mean, I think this is the greatest nation in the world in terms of fighting for freedom. <laughs> and, uh, and also one of the most tragic ones. And Catherine, the, and of course Poland, Poland was always up for grab for all these big powers. And Catherine the Great, great Russian empress and kind of reformer, she enjoyed Walter and uh, other enlighteners and she kind of, but she was as much of, as much of an imperialist as almost as Vladimir Putin, maybe more. She was still emperor after all. Uh, she wrote to Friedrich of Germany a letter saying, we should never allow Poland to do real reforms. We should hurry up because they are starting big reforms now and if we, they manage to implement real reforms, we can never divide Poland again. We can never occupy that country again. For them, Reform and modernize neighbor is a problem, was a problem for both of them. It's exactly the same thing now about Ukraine. If Ukraine builds real modern statehood, like Georgia did for the first time in hundreds of years, in, in comparative terms, we built some modern statehood in a place where it wasn't supposed to be. Caucasus, for God's sake, what kind of statehood? Caucasians were doomed according to Russian deeply entrenched psyche, and not only Russian psyche, lots of conquerors. They are there to fight with each other, to kill each other, to feud with each other, to uh, betray each other, easily. You know, the, the Russians did it very well. Russia brought to Abkhazia basically traitors of Chechen people, but for Georgians, there were Chechens coming and fighting. In 19th century, Georgians were used to fight with North Caucasians, with Imam Shamil. Now in Ukraine, the whole thing started with Chechen fighters being there. So, you know, you can just buy them off, fight with them. You know, they, it's a very interesting story, but I quote it that at the United Nations. There is, of course, Russian history makes big deal about Imam Shamil. Imam Shamil was a great leader of Northern Caucasus, but why Russians really started to love him historically? Because he surrendered. And that's, the outcome was good for the Russians. So, but there was another great commander, Baisangur, and which, whose name was totally forgotten by the Russians or sidelined. Baisangur was not welcome to be part of history. And why Baisangur is interesting for Northern Caucasus? Because he stayed, of course, in myths and in story. Baisangur, when Shamil was going to surrender, and he, gave, he told Baisangur, I'm going finally, our struggle is useless, you know how many decades, we are losing people, so we are surrendering. He said, don't look back because if you look back and look in my face, I'll shoot you. Noble tradition, you know, like chivalry, you cannot shoot people who is with his back to you. So all the time go there, he told Baisangur. Baisangur continued to fight till the end. 
until he was wounded and captured. And he was captured, so he was brought for, for, to be hanged. And the hanger was supposed to be Dagestani, who basically, and the idea was that another North Caucasian kills him, so the feud will last forever between those two tribes. And by Sangor, when he saw this poor Dagestani being dragged to pull out of his chair, pulled off his chair himself. Why? Because he said, there should be no blood for it. I'll do it myself. Now, suicide is a sin under Islam, but this was lesser seal than seal for Baisangur, sin for Baisangur than blood feed and uh, generations of animosity. And that's a very telling story about the Caucasus. And the fact that Georgia created statehood in the Caucasus means that there is a hope for all North, uh, North and South Caucasian peoples. And that, that's, and when, when we are talking about state, that's exactly what Guillermo did described it. That when people serve institutions and uh, institutions serve people and not vice versa. These institutions exist. We have new government in Georgia that hated everything we built. They came with long list of not only institutions to be destroyed, but buildings to be destroyed. They couldn't touch anything. Because they outclassed the government. And what's the surest sign of success of reforms? When reformed institutions outclass the reformers. And so and it happened in Georgia. So we already have this chance for the Caucasus. Now, if the big ch chance emerges in Ukraine, if Kiev government manages to build modern state, as it will, because there is an amazing new generation in Ukraine, with absolute new mentality, absolutely open-minded, very well-traveled, speaking foreign languages, patriotic for their own country. It's not an ethnic thing, because it's a very multicultural thing. The biggest Ukrainian patriots I've seen lately some of them come from the East, and many of them come from some South of Ukraine, tradition not ethnically Ukrainian areas. Well, when I came first to Kiev, Kiev was a Russian-speaking city. First uh, Ukraine I really heard was really at the army where there were also guys from the villages. And so if Ukraine does the same, then Putin model of post-Soviet resurrection is absolutely doomed. He, we will know and that what will happen now, that two new centers will emerge around Russia, Tbilisi and Kiev. Of course, now there are temporary difficulties in Georgia. There is change of government. New government is, let's say, quite weak and more vulnerable. But institutions are strong. And the idea is already there, which cannot be replaced. And that is the idea that attracts naturally people around us. The idea of modern functioning institutions, democracy, and the state. And this is exactly, and this was tried in 2008. You know, not a single Georgian commander surrendered, not a single piece of equipment was left behind. Every state institution during weeks and weeks of basically Russia occupying more than half of the country functioned very well because that's what state is all about. You are attacked by 100 times bigger neighbor, bombed by 200 planes, and institutions to function. People function, they don't run. Government stayed in place, everybody was in place. Felicity already is there, no matter who is in the government, and I hope the governments will also change into the better. And then Kiev will emerge, and it will be a huge thing to attract. Felicity will attract lots of people from Central Asia, South and North Caucasus. Traditionally, it was the capital of the Caucasus. Kiev will attract people who comes from Moldova, from Belarus, and from most of the Russia. And of course, it will become another big center of democracy, freedom, development, and peace. And that's absolutely new reality that expands the European model and gives absolute new dimension for European perspective worldwide, not only towards our region. And from that standpoint, it, we are really truly witnessing a historic process. Many people here, also in Europe and in America, I've heard them saying, well, Putin is so smart. This guy is really an evil, but he's a smart evil. He does everything so well. I think he's as stupid as he can get, because he just got into a big adventure that's going to kill him. Because the reality is that, and in, everywhere in Kiev, by the way, there are inscriptions, strange things, which I, I noticed in so many places that I start to think what it means. It says, Putin will die in Kremlin. I don't wish anybody physical death, but politically he's dead. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because he made a fundamental mistake now. He, he, he has his strengths and he has his major weaknesses. And his major weakness is 
that he doesn't understand how masses and how democracy generally functions and whether it's whether uh, he doesn't generally believe that democracy exists. What he thinks is that all this thing is hypocrisy. Everywhere is ruled by elites. Elites are corrupt. You can anybody can corrupt them with enough cash or intimidate them. People don't really matter. You can manipulate people. Reality does truth doesn't exist. He can create alternative truth, and that would be the truth. And he had been doing this successfully in Russian propaganda lately, so they molded him even more. So, and so that's this point he's at, at the point where he is now, where he basically started to think, according to him, he imitates what the West is doing. And he thinks that West engineered Ukrainian revolution, that CIA was behind Maidan. I was there in Maidan, I know, and I also, at that time, many times in Washington. I didn't really, you know, to my knowledge, encounter directly CIA people, but I'm sure they were sitting there and scratching their heads. How could they, first of all, Russians were furious. How could they miss CIA port to the Maidan? And CIA was scratching their heads. How could they, they ever miss this coming? But Putin cannot be convinced otherwise. He knows that CIA did it. So he thinks that this was engineered. Now he has to engineer something opposite. He thinks that West is manipulating everything. Now he has to manipulate the opposite. He thinks that there is a big geopolitical game on the West. Where in most of the instances, West couldn't care less. And he cares a lot. And so he got into a game where he cannot stop. Why I'm saying that he politically is doomed? Because, you know, it's the process is beyond. If he had just taken Crimea. And then he had said, well, you know, OK, well, I'll have a break now. And usually, the Russian Empire expanded this way. They grabbed one piece that they could like, consume like a python, and then wait, rest. And then go for another. And that was a classical Russian imperialist. Putin overplayed this. He got so emboldened by Crimea that he got carried along towards other places. And then he got carried on. And even if he decides now to withdraw, which he will not at this moment, he cannot, because Crimea is no longer a victory. Now Russians, because of propaganda creative, want victory there where he is. Donetsk and Lugansk. And of course, they want overall victory over fascists in Kiev, so-called fascists. And that which means that now he has to go on. And even if he doesn't decide to go on, he will look like a loser either way. He will look like lo either he goes on and loses, because at a certain point, there will be the moment when Europeans will know that they will have to pay this price and follow Americans. Even Americans, this administration, they wanted to stay away. I fully understand this now. Either you pay a smaller price now or a much bigger price later, but eventually you'll have to pay a price and to do it. Or, so he will be stopped at that stage, or he will have to withdraw and he will soon look, look like a loser and it will trigger other processes in Cyprus. So he really got into major trouble for himself. And I don't think one can survive that, except that, like Milosevic could not survive the string of things he got into, except that. This Milosevic this time has nuclear weapons. And this is much, has much bigger implications. And Milosevic was only after the, his region. While he told, Putin told that the last meeting Secretary General of NATO, I will destroy your organization to Rasmussen. And you know, he has, been, he has been doing this for a long time already. He has been sending warning signals. You know, in Ukraine, he offered Prime Minister of Poland two years ago, eye to eye like this, why don't we divide Ukraine? He said at NATO summit, Ukraine is an artificial country. He sent signals to Hungary, to Romania, to all the neighbors, let the white Ukraine, what's the problem? So he was sending the signals, not that anybody had heard it the first time when things started to happen. The people are saying, oh, he was spontaneously responding to Crimea, not at all. He was sending signals, that means he was prepared. This guy lies a lot, but one also has to give him credit. He also is sincere about his designs and plans. He will lie tactically for him lying is an instrument of communication. Of course, when he talks about peace, that's the moment when you should expect him to do more nasty things. But about wording his programs, he told me this in closed meetings. He also used to do it in open meetings to many of the world leaders. So what's, what is the solution here? I think that solution is very simple. Ukraine should protect its territorial integrity as much as it can, and it should start the reforms. Georgia should resume its reform course. Moldova should implement reforms. We should create the cases of success. The case at the Ukraine is easy because it was failing for so long that even small change would ma generate major difference. 
You know, I was in the city of Odessa. Look at the city of Batumi. The city of Batumi was an absolute disaster 10 years ago. We wrestled out of local law warlord, and now it's the most developed place in Black Sea and one of the fastest developed regions in the world. Odessa has 10 times bigger potential. And it stands, still stands in ruins like Batumi was 10 years ago. I was telling mayor of Odessa and governor and then Poroshenko, just take care of Odessa and it will create such a huge example for the rest of Ukraine. And it's so easy, you just need to do small things, you know, and it can produce miracles. But Batumi will be nothing in comparison if you really do it the right way. And so if you create this success now, I think what we'll get, we'll get absolutely new reality. We'll get these new big centers attracting people and masses of people from all around the place. And we'll get big change in Russia. Many Russian friends I have, I have close friends from Russia, and uh, there are some very prominent Russian intellectuals. They are totally hopeless now. They are you know, busy with the usual Russian intellectual game of self-bashing, being angry at their own people, being angry at themselves that they cannot understand their people and their people cannot understand them, and thinking that Russia's future is doomed. I think this is not the right assessment. I think no nation is doomed, especially Russians who are well-traveled, who basically have really good education level. They might have some bad habits and must, but uh, they are treatable. Uh, and, and it can happen to any nation, by the way, put under wrong leadership and wrong ideology. Uh, and so the idea is that, but the problem will be that because Putin annihilated any other political force in Russia, what he will be followed by, because his fall is inevitable, two, three, four, whatever years from now, nobody technically can last as long as that in the 21st century no matter what they come up with. Especially if somebody is on steroids of 80% popularity, that's where you really are in trouble. Because you want to sustain it all the time, you want to do, and you only sustain 80% of popularity because it's silly popularity by doing silly things. Which he will inevitably continue to do and it inevitably will lead, it lead to silly and bad outcomes for them. So what will replace Putin will be a chaos for some time. Which means that Russia will have huge problems of keeping its territorial integrity. I think the way how it treats now Northern Caucasus or say Tatarstan and Bashkortostan is a clear recipe to lose control over them in any next transformation. Because if you are treating your own citizens like second class people, like somebody to be isolated in ghettos and somebody to be looked down on, somebody who should be just, you know, bought off by cash but not just give, buy them through their elites and brutality and not even ask about how they are, they are not going to appreciate it because you are treating them like uh, old-fashioned manner of uh, empires treating colonies. Which means that eventually it all ends in decolonization. And because Russia is trying to act like an empire now, it will eventually have decolonized and withdraw not only from the territories like Crimea or uh, like Abkhazia and, of course, South Ossetia, but also from some of its own territories. Because they don't, themselves don't see Russian borders as borders. They see them as frontiers. Their neighbors are frontiers. Their neighbors are like they're kind of, they're like this open space for adventures. So if you don't see your own borders as borders, are, you're not going to keep them. That's a simple rule of any logic of development. And we should all prepare and the world should prepare and brace for it. Because artificially keeping this would be very hard. In 1990s, the world made a big mistake, I think. Understandably so, because at that moment, Russia was the most democratic place in former Soviet countries. I myself used to go to Moscow for breath of fresh air when Brothers Perestroika started. They were the first ones. So the rest of the world automatically considered, OK, they are the most democratic place. They are the most trustworthy place. So. Ukraine should not be trusted, Kazakhstan should not be trusted, Belarus should not be trusted, all nuclear weapons go back to Russia. Security Council seats should not be divided, but give, given attributed to Russia, for God knows what reason. Why, for instance, Ukraine, that is such a big country, should uh, have been deprived of that. There were big mistakes made, namely by George Bush's senior administration. In line of his Kiev's chicken speech, by the way. Uh, but, uh, 
But this mistake should not be repeated this time. I think this time the world has learned. And what they've learned that everything should be done to give all the right chances to democratic forces also in Russia and to exclude any possibility for imperial revival ever at all. Because no matter what they've done in the 90s, Russia still sustained this myth and lots of Germans identify themselves with it. They say that Russia should be understood because they were humiliated. Absolute bullshit. West did everything to accommodate and please Russia in the 90s. They gave them lots of billions that went nothing into black hole of uh, oligarchs' pockets. They gave them all these things I just described. They, you know, accepted them to G8. They expanded G7 to be big G8. They closed the eye on their adventures and their neighbors, including the situation in Abkhazia and other places, Transnistria. They got away with lots of things. And last thing one can say that West humiliated them. They didn't. But no matter what, they still came up with this myth that, whoa, we were humiliated. So, you know, we are not normal. Treat us as like we are a little bit sick, we are a little bit humiliated. So, we are bad. So, next time, no more, no more humiliation. They should be treated like normal. And when they are treated like normal, they'll be normal. If they are treated like sick, they'll become one day very sick. Again. And uh, from that standpoint, I think we are at the, on the edge of historic change. And uh, this change is coming. This change is inevitable. And I think the world should prepare for that and for these kind of changes. And again, I'm totally open for all your questions. Thank you.